My name is Jennifer Fulweiler. I was a lifelong atheist and I'm now a Christian. I write a blog called Conversion Diary. It's a chronicle of the ups and downs of what it's like to have faith after an entire life of being an atheist. I never believed in God, not even as a child. When my dad would come read books to me at night, I believe I was in fourth or fifth grade, and our nightly reading was Carl Sagan's Cosmos. <laughs> so I was very much raised on a diet of science and reason and evidence-based rational thought. You believe what you can prove. I believe that I have hands because I can see them. I believe in a black hole, even though I've never seen one, but you know, science can tell us about the way matter moves around it that we can observe. And so this very rational worldview always made sense to me. Before I got to the point that I could really start researching faith with an open mind, something had to happen. And for me, that occurred after my first child was born. I looked down and thought, what is this baby? And I thought, well, from a pure atheist materialist perspective, he is a collection of randomly evolved chemical reactions. And I realized if that's true, that all the love that I feel for him, that it's all nothing more than chemical reactions in our brains. And I looked down at him and I realized that's not true. It's not the truth. I didn't know where to go from there, but that's what prompted me to start researching topics of spirituality. You have this guy named Jesus who comes from a lower class region, gains a bunch of lower class followers, and ends up being executed by the Romans. And yet in droves, you see thousands and thousands of Jews giving up these traditions that they had held dear for thousands of years. And the people who joined in on this new religion, there was no benefit for them. It was a persecuted religion. People who joined this religion didn't tend to work out too well. They tended to lose social status and often face death. It wasn't until after I had made the intellectual decision to become a Christian that I think I finally believed it in my heart. When I set my pride aside and said, okay, I feel like I'm talking to myself, but Jesus, I want a relationship with you. I, I want to know you, even though I don't know how to go about doing that. This peace entered my life, this joy, the way my whole being was transformed. There was just no question that this is somebody real. I think that not only am I more alive uh, now that I'm a Christian, but I'm so much more intellectually alive. Finally, nothing is off limits. I can ask questions about science, but I can also ask questions about the spiritual world, and I'm free to really seek the truth. Hi, my name is Justin Gaunapratt. I'm here to be baptized. Um, I, I was born and grew up in Buddhist, and I came here to U.S. for my PhD study. And last year, I met a lot of my friends who invited me to join the Bible study, and that where I know Jesus and know story about Bible. And a lot of my friends very influenced on me, like Sean, Gavin, Jared, and Daniel. They teach me a lot about Jesus. They show me what the Bible is, and um, they answer a lot of my questions. Because I was born in Buddhist, so Jesus and Christianity very new for me, and at the very beginning, it just makes sense. Mm, something know. that I cannot explain it, something miraculous happened. Um, I went to the conference in Houston with my graduate conference and one day I woke up in the morning and I saw a lot of my friends posting their testimony on Facebook. By that time, I still don't know what the testimony is and I just asked my friends what it is, but it sounds cool, I don't know what it is. And then I read a book that Gavin gave it to me, it's the book called Morning Carpenter. And the chapter I read that day, um, the author mentioned about testimony and they have the meaning of it. So it kind of surprised. 
why um, I get the answer that the question I just asked about it and then I just get the answer kind of so one night um, I had a dream a dream showing that how evil I am I, 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 I scared I woke up at night and scared of demon and scared of um, how bad I am I, I feel like I'm not a good people I feel like um, maybe Satan tried to trick me and try to turn me to the bad people and that I realized that I need someone or something to be my savior. I opened the same book that night, Morning Carpenter, and the chapter I read is talking about if I accept Jesus to, my, to be my savior, read this verse, and I read that verse, read it again and again, and I realized that I really need um, Jesus to be my savior. So today I come here to get baptized and to show you guys that um, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and to show my heart that I completely accept Jesus Christ and I know that I need Him to be my Savior. I'm Urvashi and I'm from Delhi. My childhood was not a very uh, happy childhood. My father never liked me laughing uh, and my father never liked me seeing playing with other children. I accepted Christ as my personal savior in the first year of my college. My father got behind my life and it was the everyday thing that he used to give money to my elder brother to go and have a drink and he was badly drunk and they both will come and beat me like anything. My father would tell them that I'm a prostitute. And I do prostitution. My brother came running behind me. He was crying for help. He he told all the police members that my my sister is not a prostitute and she has not done anything wrong. She's a teacher in a school. No one no one believed us actually. That was the only point where I thought that why am I paying such a big cost for Christ? I was shaken, my heart was broken completely. But yes, as I said, God had a plan. He never left me alone. And then at one point, my brother decided that I should get married so that I can have one place where I can stay forever. And we don't have to go and hunt for different places. My brother had a friend who knew everything about me and my brother. I just went ahead and got married to him. And then uh, on the very first day, I shared the gospel with him and he said yes for that. And we started going to the church and then slowly my husband shared the gospel with my younger brother and he accepted Christ as his personal savior. Then at one point, my husband also shared the gospel with my father and my father also accepted Christ and, and now he is a believer. And I'm really happy for this miracle because I never, I never even thought that this, even this can Though happen. he gave me a very tough time for being a Christian, or for believing in Christ, I, I just paid a very high price. But of course, it can never be higher than my Christ. The price what he paid to save my life. And I really believe that he had a great plan for my life and even today Christ is there to guide me at every single step I take. Though I don't have everything very big today in life but of course I have a very good husband, a very good son and a very good brother who is a believer, a father who is a believer. God is saving my family through me.
I went to the University of Buffalo, and uh, when I was at Buffalo, that was a time in my life when I was particularly really, really searching for God. I was, there was just this deep longing in my soul of wanting to, that there was more to life, that, that what I had experienced growing up in my Jewish faith served a purpose and was good, but I just felt that there was so much more there, so much more that I wanted to know about God and myself. I read a lot of books, primarily Eastern books, all with the purpose, all with the, of, of trying to understand and, and I wanted to, to give something back to God. I didn't know how, but someone had given me a Bible several months earlier, and I thought, all right, I'm gonna read the Bible. And of course, I was familiar with the Old Testament, and I started reading the, the Old Testament. And in college, I couldn't relate but now the Bible was coming alive. Anything that I read, Genesis, Exodus, Psalms, anything, it just was so meaningful to me, and I just felt so close to God. And then I get to the New Testament. Now, being raised Jewish, I knew nothing about the New Testament or Jesus. Some of the things he said really disturbed me. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father but through me. I said, how could this be? And he said, the Father and I are one. And I said, but there's only one God. Jesus may be a great man, but, and I was so confused. I wasn't sharing this with anyone. But I was still asking God to show me that this was the right decision. Well, the pastor from that church, he was retired. He was in his early 70s. He came out to our cabin one day to see me. and. Uh, he didn't know what I was wrestling with, but he started to read a portion of scripture to me. It, it was, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, a root out of dry ground. And he was wounded for our transgressions, and, and by his stripes we are healed. And he, he said, he said, Brother Michael, he said, where do you think this is? And I said, I don't know, Matthew, Luke? And he hands me the, the Bible and I look and it said Isaiah. And I said, you're kidding. I said, this is in the Old Testament? Because it was so obvious to me that it was talking about Jesus. And he started to share with me scriptures from all over the Old Testament showing me that that Jesus was the Messiah. And, and that, that prayer that I had asked God, God, show me that this is the right decision. That day I felt so secure and so satisfied as, as this pastor started sharing with me from the Old Testament about those scriptures. And I was so thankful to God that he did. I know that uh, Christianity, I know that believing in Jesus is there, there's, there's so much from the past with, with the Holocaust and what Christians have done, but this has nothing to do with Jesus. This has nothing to do with the Bible. And, and the Messiah that was prophesied long, long time ago, if you, I, I, I just would encourage you and challenge you like, like I did to search and ask and read the scriptures for yourself with just asking God with an open heart and an open mind, could Jesus really be the Messiah? The relationship with God uh, as a typical Muslim, um, Allah was God that was distant. He had given me words that I had to follow to the letter and if I didn't I would be in trouble with him so uh, it wasn't a personal relationship with uh, with God with Allah it was like uh, like he was distant he had handed me uh, sent me a, uh, directions and commandments uh, in Quran and I had to do it and if I didn't I wasn't a good uh, Muslim and he, he wouldn't approve of me so uh, no personal relationship just trying to please him and just trying not to get him mad at me 
by being a good Muslim, once you follow Islam, you get to a point say, what am I doing? And uh, it's not really satisfying my soul. But I have to do it because if I don't, Allah will judge me and uh, I will be in trouble. So it will be a lot out of fear to, to follow religions. But uh, it was a period between 14 and uh, 2022 that I just focused on science. I said, I have a goal, I'm going to get my PhD. I, I felt if I get higher degrees, if I uh, immerse myself in science and knowledge and degrees, maybe the emptiness of my heart will go away. This is it. I said, I'm done with the research. But something happened in my heart. Uh, every day I would get up, say, I'm done. God does not relate to life. But something in my heart uh, was telling me, you think you're a good researcher? What kind of researcher are you? You just studied one book, one religion, and you make your final decision. Researchers don't do that. You, you have to study several things, several books, and then you make your final decision. And I read some of the Old Testament, and then jumped to the New Testament, to the book of Matthew, and I said, I, I don't think I'm going to find anything new in, in the Bible. Because Quran is the most complete book. This is just a subset of it. Uh, but as I was reading the uh, book of uh, Matthew, I encountered this man called Jesus, who didn't look like any other man. I thought, here is a prophet, Jesus. And he just like Muhammad. I mean, he's just all the same. They all came to tell people to be good and to follow God. But he didn't fit the profile of a prophet. I was struggling with Jesus. Is he really a prophet? Is he really savior of the world? What about Muhammad? What about Quran? I just struggled for months. What I did after a while, because uh, I couldn't make a decision, I said, I'm going to go just sit in a church uh, and uh, see what they say. After a few weeks sitting in the church, just listening, uh, a person, uh, uh, the, the pastor, gave a sermon and said, he who has a question, come forward. If you have a question, just ask me. And of course, I had many questions. And I went uh, forward to, to meet the pastor of the church, and I started asking a question. I asked him, uh, you know, I've, I've been studying Quran and Islam, and I have these questions. He said, what are they? I said, is Muhammad the, the prophet of God? He thought for a few seconds. He said, well, uh, what's he your asked, question? He let me uh, ask all my questions. He didn't answer. At the end, he said, you know what, um, I do not know the answers to your questions. But I know one thing, faith is very simple. Do you believe that you're a sinner? I said, well, um, if the standard is Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus says, if you, if you look at a woman with the lustful eyes, you have committed adultery in your heart. That, that's the high standard. Uh, I, I remember the Bible says, if you're angry at somebody, you have killed him in your heart. I mean, that's the high standard. I may not have killed anybody. I may not have committed adultery. But in my heart, according to God, I have already committed murder and adultery. For the last 20 years, Open Doors has been producing the World Watch List, which ranks the top 50 countries where it is most difficult to be a Christian. In many countries, this believers encounter intimidation, prison, or in some countries, even death. Persecution is a daily reality for millions of believers across the world. In 2014, Christians experienced intense persecution in a number of countries. In North Korea, which is ranked number one for 13 years in a row, it is estimated that 50 to 70,000 Christians are imprisoned for their faith. Iraq moved to number three on the list and has seen a mass exodus of Christians as a result of the Muslim extremist group, the Islamic State. It is estimated that 140,000 Christians have been displaced as a result. 
Nigeria's rank rose to number 10 for the first time ever. It is estimated that there have been an average of 10 people killed daily by the Islamic extremist group Boko Haram, and most are Christians. We invite you to learn more and pray for the millions of believers around the world where persecution is a reality. tragic issue of the persecution of Christians in refugee camps. After escaping the horrors most people only see on their TV screens, many Christians face targeted persecution in UN registered camps because of their faith right across the Middle East. Perhaps even more shockingly, this behavior has been witnessed in Germany with families returning to Iraq rather than face uh, face the continued persecution they face by radical Islamists here in Europe. This is for those Christians that are lucky enough to make it to Europe. The persecution in these camps means that many Christians are forced to leave. It is from these camps that legitimate refugee cases are processed. The situation they face is so bad that only a tiny percentage of Christians are processed by the UN. It is scandalous that at their most vulnerable, and when they are supposed actually uh, to be in a safe haven, surely these people should not have to continue to suffer in this way. Thank you. Rami Ayad, a father of two, died from bullet and knife wounds. Chris Mitchell has the story from Jerusalem. <laughs> Family and friends grieved over Ayad, who leaves behind a pregnant wife and two young children. Ayad served in the teacher's bookshop of Gaza's Palestinian Bible Society. The public relations director told CBN News Ayad was martyred for his faith in Jesus Christ. It's not against human flesh that our fight is, it's against the kingdom of darkness. Al-Qaeda militants staged a bloodbath. And they took hostages in a Christian church, killing more than 50 people. This is one of the many powerful testimonies included in Rome Report's new documentary, On the Border of Hell, Christian Persecution in Iraq. The film shows the challenges that displaced Christians in Iraq have faced since the rise of the Islamic State. They fled their homes with nothing but their faith and a desire to live. Many took refuge in Iraqi Kurdistan to avoid certain death. The documentary was introduced at the Iraqi embassy in Rome. The ambassador described the situation in his country a year after the ISIS invasion. Now Iraqi armed forces, above all the Peshmerga in Kurdistan, are defending these refugees and have recaptured close to 30 percent of the territory occupied by ISIS criminals. It is a global war that we are in, involving the whole world, because when there are combatants from 102 nationalities, it is a global war.
The Supreme Court recognized that the Constitution guarantees marriage equality. In doing so, they've reaffirmed that all Americans are entitled to the equal protection of the law. Clerk of Rowan County, Kentucky, standing firm on her refusal to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples. This despite the U.S. Supreme Court ordering Kim Davis to start doing so Monday night. News cameras were at the clerk's office today as Davis met with at least one same-sex couple seeking a license. Do not be issuing marriage licenses today. Why? Police are now guarding the Rowan County, Kentucky clerk's office, making sure order is maintained. Tempers are flaring from people on both sides of the gay marriage issue. Davis supporters say federal courts have violated the clerk's First Amendment right. We're here for religious freedom because it's been it stripped away. All doubt of the criminalization of Christianity in our country. Who will be next? Pastors, photographers, caterers, florists. This is a reckless, appalling, out of control decision that undermines the Constitution and our fundamental right to religious liberty. Ted Cruz said, Today, for the first time ever, the government arrested a Christian woman for living according to her faith. This is wrong. This is not America. Hillary Clinton weighed in saying government officials should uphold the law, and the White House said, the success of our democracy depends on the rule of law, and there is no public official that is above the rule of law. The battle between religious freedom and gay rights is unfolding in Colorado. A gay couple has filed a discrimination complaint against a bakery where the owner refused to sell them a wedding cake because of his Christian faith. The couple planned to marry in Massachusetts and celebrate in Colorado where civil unions are legal. Colorado law does not provide religious protections for businesses. If the baker, Jack Phillips, loses the case and continues to refuse making cakes, he would face fines of $500 per case and up to a year in jail. His attorney says, quote, it would force him to choose between his conscience and a paycheck. I just think that's an intolerable choice. In a similar case, the owner of a flower shop in Richland, Washington, is being sued because of her Christian beliefs. Baronelle Stutzman has owned Arlene's Flowers for decades. But when asked to sell flowers to a gay couple for their wedding, she declined, saying it was against her Christian beliefs. She's now being taken to court over the matter, and she spoke exclusively with CBN News about the matter. You have to make a stand somewhere in your life on what you believe and what you don't believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just a time that I had to take a stand. And everybody will have to come to that same, same time in their business. Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. The servant's not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. You see, the church and every true Christian, every true believer is hated because of our mission. I want to talk to you about the mission of the church and show you why. <clears throat> if you truly obeying the true mission of Christ to a lost world, you're going to be marked. You're going to be persecuted on the job. You're going to be persecuted in the church. <clears throat> and, and the time will come, the closer we get to fulfilling God's mission in New York, when you mention Times Square Church, you're going to people see their eyebrows go up. Oh, oh that church. Because, you see, we're going to be taking a stand against the powers of darkness as we've never taken it before. And all hell's going to get angry. 
And everyone is walking with the enemy and a rejecter of Jesus Christ is going to be an enemy. You're going to find enemies on the job. You're going to find enemies everywhere because you're fulfilling the mission. Now let me talk about this mission and some of you are going to be a little horrified by But what is my mission as a pastor? What is your mission as, 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 as a witness for Jesus Christ? It's more than going out and just telling people Jesus loves you. It's more than trying to to give people examples of how much you suffer so they'll have pity on you so they'll listen to you. Our mission is to take from un ungodly men that which is dearest to their heart, their self-righteousness. You, you, you are commissioned to go and tell men who have spent a lifetime believing that they're doing good and that they're achieving something. I'm kind to my family and I'm kind to people and they spent a lifetime building up what they believe is integrity and you come along and tell them it's filthy right. Preach that self-made integrity is not acceptable to God. That rather, be in, rather than they being in God's favor, God's wrath is upon those who will not receive his loving call to surrender all to him. We come along preaching the blood of Christ and separation from the world. We talk about submission and obedience to the word of God. And they can't conceive. Jesus said, I've chosen you out of the world. And that strikes at the heart of why we are hated. He said, I've chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you for this reason. They hate you because I called you out of their condition. I called you out of their fellowship. I called you out. And not only did I call you out, I sent you to call everybody else out.